Hi guys, I'm Srishti and I'm back with another set of 5 questions of finance for you. Today we are going to discuss more of the current affairs part of the finance and I hope that you understand each and every question and the concept behind those questions. If you like my video then do subscribe to our channel for regular updates. Hit the bell icon. So starting with the first question for today, which of the following sectors have been revised under the FDI investment route as per the amendments made in 2019. So these options have been given to you and from these options you have to choose the correct sectors that have been revised under the FDI investment route as per the amendments which have been made in 2019 itself. Before answering this question let me tell you that five sectors have been revised under the FDI investment route in 2019 and those five sectors I'll be discussing one by one that what amendments have been made in the next slide. So listen to me carefully. The first is coal and lignite mining. So in the coal sector, 100% FDI under the automatic route for coal mining activities including the associate processing infrastructure subject to provisions of coal mines. So this sector have been amended and 100% FDI under the automatic route has been given. Now notice the word associated processing infrastructure. So this includes coal washery, coal handling, crushing and separation of magnetic and the non-magnetic. The second sector which have been amended is manufacturing. 100% FDI under the automatic route and the earlier policy also provided the same. So you must be thinking then what is the amendment because earlier also it was 100% and now it is also 100%. So this is one of the important thing to note here and this sector I will be discussing in the next question because the next question relates to the manufacturing part of the FDI. The third sector which have been amended is uplinking of news and current affairs TV channels. So the earlier policy provided for 49% FDI under the approval route but now it has been decided to permit 26% FDI under the government route for uploading or streaming of news and current affairs through digital media on the lines of print media. The fourth sector which have been amended is SBRT. SBRT is a single brand retail trading. Now here also one interesting thing to note here is that there is a change in the local sourcing requirements. So in the earlier FDI policy the rule was that 30% of the value of goods has to be procured from India if the single brand retail trading entity has FDI more than 51%. So if this entity having FDI of more than 51% then the local sourcing requirement for such an entity would be 30%. But now after the amendment a relief is given to these kind of companies for initial 5 years wherein this requirement has to be made as an average of the total value of goods purchased in the 5 years. I hope that I have made myself clear to you guys and if you have any doubt any query then do ask me in the comment section so that I could clear your queries in a much better way. The fifth one is insurance intermediaries. Now the earlier policy provides 49% FDI limit but now this limit has been changed to 100%. So insurance intermediaries may be like brokers, third party administrators, insurance repository. So these are the five sectors for which the amendments for which the revisions have been made in the amendments introduced in 2019. So let us move back to our question and see that what are the options given to us and from those options we will deduce our answer. So as for the discussion that we had manufacturing sector, SBRT, insurance intermediaries, uplinking of news and current affair TV channels and coal and lignite mining. These are the five sectors. So the correct option would be option B. Now moving on to one additional thing that I want to share with you guys. So this is some of the factual data 
that is really important and you must know about it as for the rbi's annual report that has been released recently the country which has the highest fdi inflows in india is singapore with 14632 and these figures are in us dollar million earlier in 2017 18 Mauritius had the highest FDI inflow but in 2018 19 Singapore is the one which has the highest FDI inflow now if we talk about the sector wise inflows then manufacturing sector is the sector wherein FDI inflows is the highest with 7919 and in the last year also manufacturing had the highest FDI inflow sector wise so do remember that Singapore is the country with highest inflows and manufacturing is a sector with highest fdi inflows so moving on to the next question related to the manufacturing sector under the fdi as i have told you that i'll be discussing this manufacturing part in the next question so let's move on to the next one the extant fdi policy provides 100% fdi under the automatic route in manufacturing sector under which sub area of the manufacturing sector have the changes been made so four options have been given to you this question talks about that in the earlier fdi policy also 100% fdi under automatic route was there in the manufacturing sector now also it is 100% then what is the change and in which area the change has been made so let me make it clear to you guys that there was no specific provision for the contract manufacturing in the policy so in order to provide clarity on the contract manufacturing it has been decided to allow 100% fdi in manufacturing sector under the automatic route so let me make it clear to you guys that there is no specific provision for the contract manufacturing in the policy in order to provide clarity on contract manufacturing it has been decided to allow 100% fdi under automatic route in contract manufacturing in india so our answer would be option d now moving on to our third question who among the following is not eligible to apply for license for sfbs sfbs are small finance banks as per the draft guidelines issued by rbi to obtain license for sfb now recently a draft guideline has been issued by rbi to obtain the license for sfb now what is sfb it is a basic banking entity that provides bare minimum financial services with the focus on financial inclusion and expansion in the unbanked geographical areas now these are some of the small finance banks in the rural areas and they have got the licenses from the rbi now the draft guideline talks about that who is eligible to apply for the license for sfb and some of the key proposals are also there related to sfbs in this draft guidelines so before looking at the eligible and ineligible entities who can apply for the license for sfbs let us look at these terms first so as you all know the private companies are the companies whose shares may not be offered to the public for sale and which operates under the legal requirements less strict than those for a public company public sector companies are the one where the government has a large shareholding in the company then we have individual promoters then we have micro finance institutions so micro finance institution is an organization that offers financial services to the low income populations now in order to find the answer to this question let us look at the entities who are eligible and ineligible for applying to get the license for sfbs so let us first look at who can apply for sfb the individual promoters private companies societies small non bank lenders and micro finance institutions moving on to the ones who cannot apply for sfbs joint ventures between two or more promoter groups public sector entities large industrial houses nbfcs 
promoted by large conglomerates so it has been specifically mentioned that the nbfc is promoted by large conglomerates are under the ones which cannot apply for sfb's license the next is state finance corporations and lastly subsidiaries of the development finance institutions so there is nothing much to explain in this slide but you have to remember these names that under which category what type of company or what type of entity comes because this is a really important one and one question could be there in your examination related to this concept now moving back to the question the question was asking us to identify the one which is not eligible to apply for licenses for sfbs so our answer here would be option number b which is public sector companies moving on to the next question now question 9 which of the following sector has been given the liberty to maintain capital base required for setting up sfb at inr 100 crore in the initial phase despite the raise in limit to inr 200 crore so under the draft guidelines issued by rbi the minimum capital base required for setting up sfb is fixed at 200 crore from inr 100 crore earlier but there is one exception so you have to identify that which of the following institutions or the companies is the exception to have minimum capital base of 100 crores in the initial phase so before disclosing the answer let us first understand these terms one by one the first is a micro finance institution in the last question also i have discussed with you that a micro finance institution is an organization that offers financial services to the low income population now you must have seen that in order to promote financial inclusions many such type of banks have been established and are regulated the second one is the development finance institutions so development finance institutions can be classified into these four categories here the first is national development bank so the examples could be sidbi idbi the next is sector specific financial institutions so it could be either nabard nhb because nhb focuses on the housing sector whereas nabard focuses on the rural sector now next we have the investment institutions so it could be LIC UTI last is state level institutions which could be state finance corporations now moving on to the cooperative banks so their main objective is to provide the financial assistance to economically weaker sections of society so as you can see that all of these are there to promote or to have financial inclusion to the economically weaker section and they target the rural people so there are many banks established for this purpose now such banks are registered under the cooperative societies act so these are the examples for cooperative banks now moving on to the question although the minimum capital base has been raised to 200 crores from 100 crores but primary urban cooperative banks is the exception to this and the requirement will remain at 100 crores in the initial phase for them so the option c is the correct answer here now moving on to the last question of this finance mcq series of five questions the last question says which among the following is the direct impact of the imported inflation so before reading on to the options we need to have a clear idea about what imported inflation means so as the name suggests it is any kind of inflation that has been imported now in simpler terms you all know that india imports many commodities from outside countries now when the cost of these imported goods rises it is termed as imported inflation but note here that the price level of those goods remain the same but just because of the depreciation of rupees against the dollar the cost of goods imported increases for example if 1 usd is equals to rupees 50 at a time and you are importing say dollar 100 worth of goods so that comes out to be 5000 rupees worth of the goods now if there is the depreciation of rupee against the us dollar and the exchange rate is now 1 usd 
to 60 rupees. So although the price of the goods that you imported remains the same, that is dollar hundred, but in rupee terms it will increase to six thousand rupees. So just because of the depreciation of rupees, when the cost of goods imported increases, that is termed as imported inflation. I hope that I have made myself clear to you guys. And now reading the options. The first one says that imported inflation will lead to the capital account surplus. Second says it will lead to current account deficit. Third is capital account deficit. And the fourth says that it will lead to the current account surplus. Now, before answering the question, you must know that what are the components of BOP? What is the capital account? What is the current account? So, in order to answer this question, we have to have a basic idea, basic understanding of these accounts. I will be discussing these accounts in the next slide. So, listen to me carefully. But before that, I want to discuss the economic indicators now the net fdi inflows have raised trade deficit have increased from the previous financial year 18 to 19 and cad is the current account deficit and this has also raised now let us understand that what capital and current account is now there is current account there is capital account current account deals with the short term transactions in a country capital account deals with the long term ones and it records the inflows and outflows of capital that directly affects a nation's foreign assets and liability now in simple terms current account means the trade in goods that is imports or exports it is a factor trade in services like income of dividend or interest and the gifts and remittances if you receive from the foreign in the capital account as i've already told you that it records the inflows and outflows of the capital that directly affect a nation's foreign assets and liabilities so it would include foreign investment imf nr deposits commercial borrowings rupee debt services now i would like to share one example with you that if you invest in a long-term security so your money will be going out and it will be recorded in capital account but the returns on those securities in the form of dividend or interest that will be recorded in the current account so i hope that you have made a clear understanding in your minds that long term and the short term securities are the basis and what are the components of the current account and the capital account now moving back to the question now imported inflation means when the cost of your goods imported increases so eventually your import prices will be more than your export prices and as per the discussion that we had imports and exports are recorded in the current account and when imports are greater than the exports that is termed as deficits because more money is going out of your economy than the money which is coming inside your economy so the answer to this question is imported inflation will lead to the current account deficit in the bop statement which is option b with this we have completed five questions of finance mcqs today i hope that you have understood each and every concept and if not then do ask your queries in the comment section so that we could interact and i can answer your questions in a much better way do subscribe to our channel for more related videos and for regular updates thank you